Bienvenue, welcome. So great that you are here at our talk. So um, happy to be here. Be oh, I don't. Whoa, well, I don't expect this room to be this big. So uh, great that you are here. Before we start, we want to ask you three questions. So please raise your hand if you have heard today, maybe, about Dapper before. Who has heard about Dapper? Yay! Who has heard about WebAssembly before? Okay, great, amazing. And who has ever thought about using these both technologies together? <laughs> Thank you, guys, <laughs> the first row. <laughs> Okay, so you will, if you don't know about Dapper or don't know about WebAssembly, you will learn about it today. You will learn why we think these technologies are better together. And we will show you some blueprints on how to connect these technologies and, yeah, basically build your use cases with this stack. My name is Sven Fennig. I'm a principal consultant for software engineering at Liquid Replay. And yeah, I'm working mainly on cloud native application development for hybrid and multi cloud ap uh, applications uh, in environments. And I'm also a tech lead of the working group WebAssembly in the tech runtime and uh, founder of an open source project and co maintainer called KWASM. This is a logo if you want to uh, learn more about it, uh, we have a website. I have my awesome colleague, Christoph, with me, who can introduce herself, so please. Yeah, hello, and uh, also welcome um, from my side. Um, my name is Christoph Vogt. Um, I used to do a lot of um, infrastructure, I used to do a lot of um, software development, and now I'm also trying to develop a consultancy called um, Liquid Reply. Um, I'm also active member of the uh, working group WASM as a subgroup of the um, Tech Runtime. And um, today we will talk about um, applications because I think uh, most of you will have and run some kind of application. And um, what we want to achieve today, I would like to explain um, uh, with a simple, simplest example. So uh, we have an uh, image processing service which uh, should count the number of kittens of an image that we, that we process. So um, if we write an application, um, what would we need? Of course, we would need the service which is handling the request, right? You can post the image to our server, and um, the server then um, forwards this to some kind of um, image um, processing library, which can do the image detection to detect that there are actually some kittens on the image. Um, plus, I need some business logic in order to do something with this information, right? This something can be arbitrary complex, um, but in our case, we definitely want to store the amount of kittens in uh, a database. What do I need in order to um, access or to store something in a database? Of course, I need some kind of client, um, which can be uh, different from language to language, right? But the client is uh, crucial and important in order to not only maintain the connection to the database, but also like to store our um, information. But what if now I want to change my database? Um, all of a sudden, I would need to adjust my application code. I would need to um, introduce yet another um, library um, that is uh, able to communicate to this new um, database, right? What if I uh, want to do add additional um, uh, authentication? Um, there would be yet another um, library uh, as part of my stack that is not yet even an image. And what if I want to write a similar app, like a similar app, which is uh, actually a web server, has some business logic, but maybe just processing uh, different things? In this specific case, I would uh, reinvent the entire wheel and need to rewrite a lot of code. So introducing Dapper, um, which uh, helps exactly with this uh, issue. Dapper is the distributed application runtime, and it's an open source project and uh, actually pretty widely distributed already and has a lot of stars on GitHub, so definitely check it out. And um, it provides a set of building blocks that uh, developers can use to like, build scalable, resilient, and cloud-native applications with the goal that the dev itself doesn't need to deal with the intricacies of like, the com complexity of uh, cloud-native environments. 
and um, Depper provides various, various uh, building blocks. You see them all there here in, in the row. Most importantly for now are the building blocks of state management because Depper um, contains a set of libraries that know how to talk to a various sets of databases. So for instance, it contains a library to talk to a PostgreSQL database, as well as it knows how to talk to a MongoDB database. All that I would need to do is change some configuration on the Depper side. But the actual application only communicates to Depper, um, uh, to the database through Depper. Um, of course, Depper also um, um, adds a lot of other building blocks. Um, the most uh, importantly, PubSub, um, a lot of observability stuff, um, authentication. It uh, adds things for secret management, a lot of stuff that you usually need in cloud native applications. It's designed to work in any kind of environment, environment, so it doesn't make any kind of assumptions that you are actually running in Kubernetes. But of course, it's nice to uh, work with this in, in Kubernetes. So. Adding Depper to the equation, our architecture would look something like this. So we have a Depper, for instance, as a sidecar. And um, Depper basically takes over the communication and the, the, um, yeah, the, the communication to the database. And my actual application only know, needs to know how to talk to Depper. But it doesn't need to know how to talk to the specific um, interface of the, of the database anymore. So what did I achieve with this uh, change? The benefits are, of course, I can change my, uh, my, my database, which means if I was on Postgres, I now need to change the configuration only on Depper side and uh, can, you, can use, for instance, MongoDB or any other supported um, database. And um, Depper can also handle authentication for me. So this means uh, uh, Depper itself uh, provides means to you to to do OAuth, um, so I can add it to my actual uh, identity provider and um, yeah, authenticate the request that I have. But what if I want to write a similar app? There's still like a big chunk of the app which is still like, that I would still need to rewrite. And um, yeah, um, that needs to be uh, improved here, right? So this is where we propose a WebAssembly. And we think that WebAssembly would be a very good thing. But what is WebAssembly actually? So WebAssembly is a, first and foremost a compilation target. So if you right now have applications and you compile it, you most likely compile it to a, for a certain processor architecture like x86 or ARM. And uh, there would be now a new compiler target called WebAssembly. And uh, what it does basically is that uh, WebAssembly, um, or WebAssembly itself is like a binary instruction format for uh, a virtual machine. And, um, it uh, is an abstraction for, for the processor, so to say. And WebAssembly has been developed with uh, like 12 design goals, but I would like to highlight four which are most important and like prominent for our use case. So on the one hand side, it's extremely portable. So it does not make any um, architectural assumptions that are not broadly supported across like modern hardware. So it claims to run on any, or you can compile it on any kind of hardware. Um, it can be compiled on all uh, kind of um, architectures, like be it, be it desktop, be it mobile, or uh, any kind of embedded systems. And it can be integrated in browsers, as you might know already, um, as well as for like standalone VMs or other integrated in environments. Uh, one great USP is like its uh, safety promises. Um, the code executes in a memory safe sandbox environment, preventing data corruption or security breaches. Um, it embraces a security model that's called uh, a capability-based security model that you're most likely familiar from your mobile devices. So if you want to um, give an application or a lot of application, if you want to um, give it access to your photo roll or camera roll, you explicitly have to allow this. And this is basically exactly this capability-based model. WebAssembly is uh, fast. It claims to be um, near, uh, like near native uh, um, from a code performance uh, perspective, which basically means that if you compile your code to JavaScript, it will be as almost as fast as JavaScript, but not faster. And it's a polyglot in the way that it does not um, privilege any particular language uh, or programming model. Um, and uh, it's basically up to the um, programming language uh, tool chain to implement this back to WebAssembly. So 
how do you interface, how do you work with Web WebAssembly conceptually? So let's assume I want to create a function which is uh, adding always uh, plus one to, to a parameter. Um, in any language, I would compile this to WebAssembly. The result is a WebAssembly module. And um, I can take this WebAssembly module, this, this output, and load it into another application that has a, a WebAssembly runtime. Um, in the process of loading this uh, into the runtime, we create um, the security sandbox that I was mentioning, um, which basically means that I would explicitly need to allow um, any kind of I.O. that I want to do between the guests, like the WebAssembly thing or, or the host. And um, the beauty of this is actually that I can compile this WASM module once and give it to, I don't know, the other department or to my colleague, and all of a sudden he has this, this compilation uh, result and can uh, use it in his exact uh, his own application without recompiling it. He doesn't even need to know in which kind of language this is written. He only needs to know what it does. And this is pretty cool, right? Because, um, yeah, uh, this would basically actually allow to, to share libraries, for instance. Um, but now let's compare like the goals of uh, Wasm and uh, Depper. Be <laughs> sorry, because um, the goals are actually um, very uh, similar, and uh, both of them have tried to avoid uh, the um, boilerplate code and try to foster code reuse. So this means like less code that I have to reinvent in a way um, creates more reliable architectures, and uh, this also means like less bugs to introduce, right? Adding Dapper to your architecture is relatively lightweight, so is um, WebAssembly in terms of additional costs at runtime. And both uh, aim to give a developer the freedom of choice. So both of them try to make a minimum set of assumptions of what kind of language, what kind of tool chain, what kind of architectures you, you actually run on, and they try to be very flexible in the sense. And um, yeah, both add on security but they do all of this on different levels, as you might already notice. So our claim is basically that we want to use WebAssembly together with uh, Dapper, um, because we want to use WebAssembly for its uh, runtime specifics, its security, its, its speed. Um, and with Dapper on the other hand side, we get uh, interfaces to all this uh, kind of neat services, and we additionally get um, things like so observability, authentication, and uh, all, the, uh, all this kind of things. Um, that I would otherwise need to develop on my own in this new application. Um, plus, uh, to everyone who is familiar with WebAssembly, um, the, um, the ecosystem is still developing, so Depper definitely also helps to overcome a lot of shortcomings that WebAssembly has right now. So if you want to use it right now, this is a very um, good bet um, to, to work with. So how would our application look like if we would integrate both um, technologies. So this would mean that I would um, add either libraries or, or, or kind of handlers um, and uh, write and compile them to WebAssembly, which means that now, all of a sudden, I can reuse the actual host, the majority of my, of my actual application, and only would ne need to reinvent the actual business logic on this side. And um, this is basically the, the, um, the promise or the, the uh, a very nice thing that we, that we think is definitely worth investigating. And um, Sven will now show you how to actually connect both technologies together. Thank you, Christoph. So, yeah, we will now have a look on how exactly connect WebAssembly with Dapp. We thought about a lot of use cases and not every use case is looking like the other. So you have different architectures in uh, terms of WebAssembly, you have different runtimes, you can use uh, a lot of languages and a very important thing about your application is uh, the invocation characteristics. So how is your application being called and how often is it calling another application? When you deploy your application to a platform, uh, for example, Kubernetes, you can do a lot of choices. Like, do you, in terms of Dapper, do you want to deploy it as a sidecar in shared mode? Do you connect via HTTP, gRPC? In, have, do you have a WebAssembly standalone runtime or do you embed it into a bigger application? How do you uh, do scaling? 
and we want to uh, give you a starting point where you can still do these choices uh, based on what's best for your use case. What we came up with is a blueprint. So in contrast to a pattern where you have a specific problem in mind and you can just apply the pattern, the blueprint is a starting point that you can easily adapt to your specific needs. So we have four points here, considerations. So what do you need to consider when you are applying this? Prerequisites, what do you need to uh, apply this blueprint? Most important, variations. So what choices do you, can you still make and how you, you can adapt it? And limitations, so when should you not do them? The first thing is something um, yeah, I would say an, an, uh, something to easily get started. Um, Dapper already ships with a WebAssembly runtime on board. You don't need to do anything. You don't need to deploy something besides Dapper. You can just use Dapper. It's initially created that you can easily customize your uh, Dapper without recompiling it and redeploying it. Um, things you need to consider, um, so Wazero is already there. Uh, you can host pure functions, for example, for uh, transformation or validation. So you already have a validation log logic. You can compile it to WebAssembly. You can host it on Dapper and just shoot request against it and it says OK or not OK. As prerequisite, you need almost nothing than your Dapper deployment, a function you uh, can compile to WebAssembly and a way to bring your WebAssembly to your Dapper deployment. Uh, in the variations, so it doesn't matter how you get your WebAssembly into the containers. You can build it in an image, so you just put it together, deploy it, you can mount a volume, you can have an init container that pulls your WebAssembly during startup, and you can still with this HTTP middleware do what it's supposed to, so to routing, to uh, filtering, block access. So uh, it's something where you can very easy get started and you have al almost no entry barrier. Limitation, it's only for pure functions. So if you need everything you need to do, you get a request, you can do something, you can write an, um, you can write an um, response and that's basically it. So let's go to something uh, I would say more widely uh, uh, used uh, a microservice. So you can also write a microservice in your WebAssembly runtime. A microservice is a very common architectural pattern and almost all WebAssembly runtimes have the uh, capability to start an HTTP server and do HTTP requests. For our case, that's uh, almost, uh, so, so that's the minimum requirement to connect uh, to Dapper because the APIs are exposed via HTTP and we can just get started. So we don't need to have a uh, uh, database driver or something like that. We just can HTTP to Dapper and get the capabilities we need. With input bindings, we can also um, get called with other than HTTP, for example, with a PubSub or the Kafka input binding and make our application available to, uh, to those uh, platforms. And uh, we can scale with this pattern pretty well, so horizontally, uh, like we love it in our uh, cloud-native ecosystem. As prerequisite, we just need a WebAssembly st standalone runtime that supports HTTP for client and server, which are at the moment almost all of them in uh, one way or the other. So as a variation, we have um, yeah, just being called, by, uh, or uh, the uh, WASM server is called directly and can use Dapper as a backend, but we can use every other capability as well, so we can be called by PubSub, invoke our module, uh, changing our state and giving back the response. So limitation is only uh, when we need non-HTTP um, yeah, characteristics, um, then we would uh, change our pattern slightly. Talking about that, 
if HTTP has quite some overhead. So if I have lots of triggered uh, invocations, then HTTP may slow down a little bit the uh, connection, but therefore, fortunately, uh, DEPA has the ab uh, ability to uh, use gRPC. Unfortunately, most of WebAssembly runtimes don't have the capability to do gRPC. It's just a matter of implementation, and that will change over time. But uh, for now, um, we need to have something in between to get uh, these features uh, yeah, to work. Fortunately, WebAssembly is a great plugin system. So that is one of the use cases if you have an application. All major runtimes have SDKs for a lot of languages where you can just embed the WebAssembly runtime in your application. And that's really one of the strengths. And what we can do with this is when we have a runtime with an SDK, a supported language, and uh, we are willing to invest some development effort, we can create a yeah, very thin layer that just do, does the gRPC communication and expose the API to our WebAssembly runtime via host calls. Um, as an example here, I have just a REST application that is doing the uh, gRPC calls and just forwarding it to our WebAssembly um, application and then accepting um, host function calls that are then mapped again. Oh, um, but what we also can do is that we have more logic in our um, application, like we can have a local state, we can do caching to even reduce the calls more um, than we would do now. Um, the limitation in this case is that we would need to have some more uh, implementation effort. So what do we say? Uh, is the combination of DEPA and WebAssembly uh, something that I would say um, really lives up to its promises? Um, you can already start with very, very few boilerplate code and just have the standard case of a microservice and communicate with DEPA like you would do with any other technology that is not the WebAssembly. But you can with a little more development effort, really gain all the advantages you have right now and are not available in the WebAssembly ecosystem right now. Especially observability is a really, really huge thing because um, enabling observability in pure WASM has some overhead and repetitive code, what we don't uh, want to. And here, DEPA really brings uh, a huge value. And you are still very flexible, so you can build architectures you are familiar right now and uh, switch over to WebAssembly and gradually uh, shift to a more functional, uh, fun function-based approach and make use of all the future um, innovations that WebAssembly brings, like the component model, but this is not the uh, WebAssembly day. So what it's good for? It's good for cloud-native architectures, so that really uh, works well. What's not so good for? If you have a very highly specialized UDP protocol or do want to do system pro programming, you may choose another tool. Where do we go from here? So unfortunately, uh, 25 minutes is not really enough to give like an entire demo, but um, our friends from um, Second State um, created a course on running WebAssembly together with um, Debra. Um, uh, they published it uh, together with uh, Mandarin Publications. Um, furthermore, you see this uh, Git repository, so they also have um, a couple of examples of how you can actually do this, so you can definitely work through them. Um, and uh, by the way, we are also working on a DEPA and WebAssembly course, so stay tuned for this and follow our socials. And um, if you want to learn more about WebAssembly or the WebAssembly and Kubernetes com combination, so there are more ways to run WebAssembly on Kubernetes. Um, so if you want to learn more about the core technology, there's a very gro great course of um, our friends from Sibo uh, Cloud. 
um, you see the link here. And um, also, if you want to learn more about our work, what we are working on, um, we just uh, last week released a tool called um, SpinCube, uh, or basically we contributed to this to uh, tool. And uh, if you want to learn more about this tool, there's a presentation during KubeCon by Matt Butcher, the uh, inventor of Helm, who is like the um, yeah, CEO of the company who also created this tool.